holiday or school holidays. I don't know. I don't know what it's like over there, but it is fair to wonder whether I might have changed plans without notifying you. <laughs> no, no, that's not what I mean. I mean, I should have checked last week, but I forgot to uh, check. <laughs> and then I'm like, can we plan a year from now? We just all the days will be off. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad that we're all here. Yeah, we were actually just being zombies, so we had to change out of costume. I need to hear more about this. It's a sarcastic <laughs> comment. We were not just being zombies. That's the latest really <laughs> Halloween. I was talking to someone yesterday and they were like appalled that I am not doing a Halloween costume for my dog. It was so funny. Aww. Their level of shock was just like like I committed a crime. I was like, wow. <laughs> she is going to be Barbie, just not this year. She is. Ooh, Barbie. Nice. She's a Barbie doll vibe. Cool. Well, hi, everybody. If you're joining us in the chat, Maybe, maybe I'm talking to myself, maybe not. Um, hello. <laughs> Welcome to the This Is Not Therapy Hour. This um, is every week. Uh, we meet at uh, 1 p.m. Central. Um, and it's a, an open session, a chance to have a chat with Brandon and Caitlin from Effective Artistry. My name's Marie. I'm an executive functioning coach and I work remotely um, as part of the Effective Artistry team. And uh, Brandon and Caitlin are therapists based in Northbrook, Illinois. So if you're curious about therapy and you're in the state of Illinois, um, there's a whole team of therapists there who'd be happy to work with you. And if you're interested in coaching, there's myself and another coach, Sarah, and we can work with you wherever you are in the world. Um, and you can find out more about the practice at effectiveartistry.com. Um, so this is not therapy. That's the title of the show, but it's a chance for you to put questions to Brandon and Caitlin, um, about anything to do with neurodiversity or mental health or anything else that's on your mind. Mike? What's yes. that? Yeah. Well, I didn't say anything, but I'm playing with okay. a noisy pigeon. If that makes, let me know if it's a problem. No, I, <laughs> if there's going to be a, a sound problem at my end, it's, probably going to be the people who are setting off fireworks right outside my building tonight. They picked like a, a really holiday? unusual spot to do that. Pardon? Is there a holiday or something? Or is it just yeah, apparently. Yeah, there's something coming up. I don't know. Um, so, yeah, they, they started doing it uh, about 10 minutes ago, <laughs> maybe 15 minutes ago. Mm -hmm. And it is quite loud, so that might occasionally breakthrough on the audio. So apologies in advance if you hear some loud booms and crackles. Um, so yeah, um, so we have Halloween tomorrow and then Guy Fawkes Night on the 5th of November, which is e an even bigger deal here than Halloween. Um, so there's going to be fireworks for the next week or more. What does it celebrate and can you repeat the name of it? Guy Fawkes Night. So Guy Fawkes was he was really the fall guy, I guess, for what was the gunpowder plot, which was a plot by a group of Catholic revolutionaries, I think, to bomb the Houses of Parliament in England. Yeah. Yeah. Kill the king. Gunpowder. That's why it's called the gunpowder. Yeah. So every year since whenever the heck that happened, I don't know. Um, there's a big fireworks display on the 5th of November and they usually burn an effigy of um, the guy, as it's now called. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That was more, no offense, but barbaric than I expected. To be. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, was like, I was hoping it was like a post Halloween moon ritual with a bunch of witches or something. That's what I was hoping for. What was, what did you want to say, Brendan? Uh, there, <laughs> there was a famous graphic novel that was then made into a movie called V for Vendetta that uses oh. Guy Fox imagery a lot. And so you have, I would bet a lot of money that you have seen Guy Fox masks because ever since then mm -hmm. people will wear Guy Fox masks when they're doing Oh, the, like anonymous, oh, you know, the collect the hacker oh, collector called anonymous. Yeah. Will often mm -hmm. wear a box mask when they're doing things. Oh, those masks. So I kind of butchered the history of that because it's 
it's uh, English history with which I'm not very familiar. But okay, so I looked it up on Wikipedia. So it's from 1605. That was the failed gunpowder plot. And they tried to blow up the House of Lords to assassinate King James the First of England. So yeah, wow. but it's it's still a big thing here. There will be a huge fireworks display in town on the 5th of November. So from tonight until whenever the fireworks run out, first or second week in November, there's going to be banging and thudding and flashy lights. Every night. It's loads of fun. My cat is terrified. There's <laughs> a little like, what you wouldn't call it, like a little rhyme, a little like mnemonic poem about it. Yeah. But I don't actually remember the whole thing. Remember, remember the remember, 5th remember the fifth of November. That's the only bit I remember of it. <laughs> remember, remember the the fifth of November, the gunpowder treason and plot. Something, something, something. I can think of no reason the gunpowder treason should ever, or the fifth of November should ever be forgotten. Like, yeah. It's like you know, remember the Alamo. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. oh. Don't forget what those people did to us, kind of thing. Yeah, which is always helpful for global peace. That's not like yeah. actually what the, the it's celebrated for these days, though, right? Like, no, it's just an excuse for a, a, a get together. It's a family kind of a event, I guess. You know, there'll be a where I am. There's going to be a, a big fireworks display, usually anyway, on the beach, and lot of people gather just to watch. Oh, the beach sounds fun. Yeah, yeah, and they called it going guising. That's a Scottish way of putting it, I guess. Going guys, are you going guys in? <laughs> I don't know what's your the Scottish accent there too. Oh my god. Oh guys, okay. <laughs> so yeah. Like oh Halloween's not a big deal over here. I know it's it's a pretty big celebration in the US now. And it it is a big deal in Ireland. But I think we seem to have re-imported some of the American traditions that have developed out of the Irish tradition. So it's sort of a back and forth. <laughs> Hollywood will do that. Plenty yeah. of like Halloween stuff in movies. That's been mm -hmm. The history of Halloween is actually very interesting. Well, not that I know all of it, but the parts of it that I do know. Was part of it Day of the Dead? No, although um, similar like root things going on. Yeah, I think the church co-opted it. So into all sail all saints and all souls day. But it was a traditionally a pagan festival way back when. Yes. November first is the um oh, in places other than England Guy Fox Day is sometimes celebrated as an anti Catholic day. So some people still do it that way. Interesting. Thank you for reading my comments. Thank you. Um, that is interesting. Yeah. So November 1st was a, a particular special day, and I don't remember the specifics of it, but so the night before, that's why it's the, it was All Hallows Eve or whatever, was considered to be a time that like the veil between the realms of dinner, which that is in common with Day of the Dead mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, a lot of stuff happened that turned it into modern american halloween and a lot of that stuff happened mm -hmm. in america in like the 20th century you know, yeah. and stuff is an american deal anyway yeah a lot of old, like carving pumpkins descends from an old irish custom of carving its beets or turnips something like that a turnip yeah or well probably a swede really um that term is used interchangeably um, and I, I, I wasn't sure where that jack-o'-lantern tradition came from first, but I think it's supposed to be to ward off evil spirits. You, you carved it out and you lit a candle in it, and it was supposed to keep, keep the the ghosts away. <laughs> and that became a pumpkin because it was easier to get pumpkins, and they're easier to carve in the U.S. And now we carve pumpkins over here. So there's also all that. All that overlap with old Irish, you know, like the Fae and the Fairy, the the Seely and Unseely courts, and like the between the realms, and which I find fascinating. Mm -hmm. And I can even connect that back to neurodivergence if we need a transition. I was just oh, please do. 
Yes. Go ahead. Oh, I was, well, I was going to start with saying at Effective Artistry, we're always in between two worlds and there's a fail. And then I was going <laughs> to say something like hypersensitivity to, I don't know. You do it, Brandon. Well, I, I thought you were, there's a particular concept that I've shared with you before. Weird? You like changeling. Change. That's from Irish folklore. That I was, oh, God. A, a changeling was like, that sometimes the fairy would swap out a human baby with one of theirs you know mm -hmm. they grow up and they'd be a little bit off a little bit different so there's a lot of people who theorize about that calling people changelings was a way of you know that it was autistic people and that that's the way in which they were off or different and they're saying they're, they're part fairy or something mm -hmm. yeah. yeah there's a there's a phrase that i hear often and that i use myself sometimes if somebody sort of drifted off and you know staring off into space thinking about something if they're lost in thought you're away with the fairies so i'll catch <laughs> myself sometimes spacing out and i'll say oh i'm sorry i'm away with the fairies and yeah that's where that probably comes from too i love to say staring into the middle distance and i don't know where that one comes yeah. from I don't know the root of that. Yeah. Sounds like a hypnotic. It's just an old phrase for, you know, staring at nothing. Is you're staring into the middle distance. I don't know what that comes from. I'm curious now. Mm -hmm. But I'll look it up some other time. What should we talk about? Well, I like the idea of talking about fairies and neurodiversity. I'd be curious about that. Or anything else that anybody would like to talk about, I'm I'm here to to learn. Same as anybody who's watching. <laughs> I was um, yesterday one of my favorite podcasts, my favorite social relationships, but um, was talking about the selfie. Oh yeah. Yeah, and I was like, I get that so much. So they were talking about the myth of the selfie and the idea. The the specific story they were telling is that. A seal comes to the shore, sheds its seal skin, becomes is then like a woman, and then a man marries her. They have seven children. She's a great mom. And then she's looking for the selkie skin, and one of her children says, oh, daddy keeps that like weird thing. It's like a pelt. And so she goes to the closet, gets the pelt, put it on, puts it on, runs back into the sea, and then disappears, and the husband is fishing and then he the boat goes past her and she says something about like it was some rhyme about i'll always be happier in the sea even though i loved you and our children or something like that it tracks there I really like that. Yeah, yeah and i was talking about how a lot of like women can you know, and then it's sort of like the darker side of motherhood, like the feeling of wanting to like run away and be yourself again, but blah, blah, blah. So, there is. There's, there's a decent amount of evidence that um, earlier, like North American or like uh, indigenous peoples from like the Northern, you know, the Arctic circle and whatever, that sometimes every once in a while some of them made it over to Ireland and so there's some theory that the story of the Selkie is like in part uh, passed down like oral legend about yep some people in a boat you know like wearing seal pelts and with different cultures and traditions and whatever speaking a different language showed up yeah. and then of course like all oral tradition it, it morphs over time to yeah. to take on other things and match mm -hmm. parts of the culture and Wow. So yeah, the I mean mermaids. Yeah. Is thing in our culture that mm -hmm. that that's not where the like the stories of mermaids originated, but the idea of hell. What's the movie Splash with Tom Hanks? That like you know a, a man meeting a mermaid who becomes uh, the Little Mermaid. I thought part of it origin. was the like um the sirens in the Greek myth. I thought that was part of the origin of the mermaid singing to the sailors and then don't they like die or something yeah There's older something. mermaids were killing people yeah mm. but a lot of those things just come from like 
sailors you're out at sea and you see weird stuff and everything is dangerous and you know all the stories should probably carry the message of no matter what you think you see down there don't go to it because yeah. uh, actually mean, yeah. then, no go ahead there's another in fact when you first said selkie i was thinking of a kelpie i got it mixed up in my head which is another a kelpie is a i think that's irish right i thought Not it was irish. scottish Maybe it's there's a there's a lot of overlap. I'm gonna so, look it up again. <laughs> creature that, that lives on the water and whatever, but it can appear as a horse, come out of the water and appear as a horse, and then people ride it, and then it changes, and it like gets them stuck in it and goes under the water, and they drown. Whoa! So it's Irish oh, and Scottish folklore. There's a huge um, sculpture of two kelpies in Falkirk in Scotland. It's really beautiful. Um, but yeah, um, a shape shaping spirit inhabiting locks in Irish and Scottish folklore. Mm. Yeah. We, we, <laughs> I, I wish I knew a little bit more about all of this. We could have like a whole ghost stories episode today. <laughs> I mean, honestly, there are some connections to neurodiversity specifically, but also just generally to things that I think are interesting and useful to discuss, talking about language, oral traditions, and storytelling, and whatever. Um, but I also would say I don't think it's a coincidence. I, I guess this is anecdotal, what I'm saying. It's not like something I have, I'm aware of research, but anecdotally it certainly seems like there is a strong origin people and interest in what we would call genre fiction like sci-fi fantasy mm -hmm. mythology like very common thing mm -hmm. for autistic children to really be into old mythology like i was especially... just thinking last night oh i'm sorry no, um when i was a kid my parents took me to something called drama camp and we reenacted greek myths and i was like I don't remember any of it, but it tracks so much. And it was like, that's such a beautiful thing. And I thought of that after the selfie thing. It's interesting. Yeah. It is, I found all that stuff very interesting for my own reasons, but there is certainly some, again, anecdotal, but correlation between being neurodivergent and really being very into fandom of any kind, really. You know, like the way that special interests work and whatever, but especially mm -hmm. sci-fi and fantasy and yeah. horror as well. Yeah. Horror, mm -hmm. genre fiction. Do you have any theories as to why that is? I have theories on theories about everything. Uh, <laughs> Russian doll theories. <laughs> so some of it is, I think some of it is definitely like the way that people used to talk about marijuana as being a gateway drug that some of it is just about what you're exposed to once you start working in certain social circles, right? That like you connect with people on a certain thing and those kinds of people tend to like a thing. You tend to get into the things that the people around you like for sure. So would that be like nerd video games, weird D and D fantasy novels, dressing up Comic-Con. I feel like that's sure. Great. All these things relate to one another, but like one in particular, yeah, is gaming. If mm -hmm. there are reasons that at least we could easily theorize about why neurodivergent people, particularly those who are very interested in learning rules and parameters and how to operate mm -hmm. with whatever would be interested in games, a very mm -hmm. structured social interaction and whatever. Mm -hmm. And the, yeah, if you, if you like playing Magic the Gathering, which I do, then sooner or later you're likely going to end up at the local game store and the other mm -hmm. people there are going to likely enjoy other things. Mm -hmm. and, um, anime certainly is in yeah, the realm of thing as too, well. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, as far as like what thing you might start with and whatever, some of it is just exposure to what your friends and peers enjoy. Mm -hmm. When it comes to fiction and fandom, I think part of it is about, so when I'm talking with people that are struggling to fall asleep at night because of like their mind racing, as we did a few weeks ago, I'll often recommend doing something which takes up all of your awareness but mm -hmm. isn't actually urgent or important right there's a reason that we like to read books commonly at night mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and genre fiction as opposed to what's called literary fiction or lit fic, you know the, the kind of stuff that tends to be more like oprah book clubs type 
type mm -hmm. things, you know, mm -hmm. things that are set in our world today. Genre fiction is set in an entirely different world. Even if it's on Earth, um, there are different rules. Yeah. And so you can't really, like, you can think about that as much as you want, and you can't really fully conceptualize an entire other world. Whereas reading a story about something that's happening in our world, I can think about the story without having any adjacent, like, extraneous pieces. So it might not take my whole focus. Mm -hmm. In fact, world building is, I think, very little known activity that people will engage in as a sort of like mental stim where you just you kind of make up your own worlds in your head um, there's also a related thing called conlanging constructed language yeah as a word construct make up languages like what jrr tolkien did for the lord of the Rings. but you on reddit and look up conlanging and world building and you'll see People that there's no intention to ever do anything with these things. It's just a thing that they do as a hobby. And of course, Didn't you say world building is similar. And again, I've never played D and D, but similar to what a DM does. Because I had people yes. talk about like writing like 50 page documents with all. The, yes. <laughs> the yeah, absolutely. That's one of the more common ways that if you're building a world, mm -hmm. you know, to like utilize it would be either creating fiction in it or running games in it. Mm -hmm. And there's it's a Venn diagram because you can DM, you can run games in other like established settings. You don't have to create up your your own stuff for it. Oh, okay. Uh, but oftentimes people will, yes. Yep. Hey, uh, you have a comment here from from Robbie who says, "I've heard the interest in stories also are a form of learning scripting." What does learning scripting mean? Yeah. Scripting meaning well, you can clarify, uh, commenter, but. Um, like how to create dialogue between characters in written form? No, like how to figure out how to navigate social situations, oh, like yeah. learning how you're supposed to respond to things. Yeah. Uh, and definitely, yes, that is true, but also not not a secret, like, and not unique to neurodivergent people, obviously. Like, mm -hmm. a lot of our stories very explicitly are about conveying some lesson or instructing people on what to do or what not to do. You know, like all of the Grimm's fort fairy tales are some version of listen to your parents or terrible things will happen. Really to you. bad things. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you know, when, when real life is already kind of bleak, you know, that's the, true. The it things has to that be you gotta awful. do to scare kids. That's true. Really... Yeah, you're gonna get like eaten in a forest by a um, honestly <laughs> just witch. meaning making and storytelling and all this stuff to me is very fascinating. Surprise, surprise. Uh, but yeah, definitely it's it's a way, part of the intrigue is in like learning how, I think especially honestly, part of the reason that Greek mythology tends to capture certain people's attention so much at a young age in our culture is because ancient Greece is often talked about and considered to be like a root uh, influence of yeah. our culture or of Western civilization, whatever. Mm -hmm. So there's some element of, I mean, once you, it's kind of like Shakespeare too, you know, like once you start to see these tropes, you see them everywhere. So I would talk about it as schema building, right? That like, if you know the story of Tristan and Isolde or Orpheus and Eurydice mm -hmm. or whatever, mm -hmm. then, then you have like a web of information mm -hmm. that can help you understand things. And when you see something new, being able to connect it to that existing web is a way of understanding it. Would you say that's one of the primary functions of Jungian analysis with archetypal? I suppose. I mean, it sounds really similar to some of that. I'm not saying. Would you say one of the say that again? One of the primary what's of it? One of the primary functions. It was something else. Function. I I don't know that I could say with much confidence what. Jungian analysis is aiming to do other than like, you know, insight based therapy. Yeah. But I do think that this is if you think of psychoanalysis generally and Jungian analysis a version of that, if you think of it like code breaking, you know, like what you're trying to do is deconstruct okay, like like when you're reading the Scarlet Letter, 
in high school and they teach you that, okay, this symbolizes that and this is a metaphor for that, mm -hmm. that a lot of psychoanalysis is very similar, sometimes explicitly where mm -hmm. they say, oh, this thing represents this other thing, you know, in your dream, this, this thing your represents, dream or whatever. right, yeah. that, that it's kind of trying to like decode mm -hmm. and figure out what's the real message behind the mm -hmm. overt, that's what like Freud's use of overt versus covert, mm -hmm. um, what's the secret hidden meaning and whatever. And any version of code breaking is built, yeah, on a series of like symbols. You know, we have a mm -hmm. cultural, like the, the dream about your teeth falling out symbolizes a feeling of being out of control, like a loss of control in your own life, right? What, you know, like how would we, what's the evidence to suggest that? What even theoretical evidence could there be to suggest that? But, you know, it's an idea that's been put out there and, and maybe it correlates to things enough for people that it continues to get spread and whatever. It's just a new piece of thing making, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, if you see a snake in your dream, it can represent uh, coming up on a difficult decision or a time of, of uh, uncertainty. And different cultures will have different symbols. Yeah. yeah. Actually, there's a... This is like something I saw online. I, it's not like a, I think it draws on actual research, but I don't know, it might just be a poll. But it was talking about the most common nightmares, like anxiety dreams in different regions. Wow. And that in America, as most Americans probably would understand, if I say what's the most common stress dream or anxiety dream, it's always around school. Mm. That's unique to America. We think of that as like, just a human thing, but of course yeah. it's not. People's experiences and whatever are different. So I, I always think that's fascinating when people are talking about education that like nobody thinks it's worth exploring that like even decades after you're out of school, you still have stressful dreams about yeah. school. Mm -hmm. like, anyway. Um, yeah, so I think there's certainly some learning scripting or like decoding, you know, like people love to be, think of like literary or film criticism or any kind of art criticism mm -hmm. where people yeah. really enjoy being able to break something down and say, what is it that this represents or is meant to convey or mm -hmm. invoke or whatever. Yeah. And if you look at fandom, yeah, that's happening all over the place. Like a, a large yeah. part of fandom is about connecting it to other stories and making predictions about what might happen when Harry Potter was coming out and like when it was still being released. Yeah. The amount of time and energy that people would spend theorizing about, oh, this symbolic thing means that this person's the next person mm -hmm. to die. And it's very enjoyable. It's a way to like try and predict the future based off of connections between yada yada. No, I love this. I mean... uh, but a lot of it is just language games. Same with like logic puzzles and riddles and paradoxes and whatever. It's just language games. And those are intriguing. Hi, Fast Insider. Fast Insider says, it's been interesting playing Baldur's Gate 3 with a friend because she likes the exact opposite characters that I like, except Carlock, obviously. So you know about Carlock. I do. We talked about Carlock and Carlock's. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Another just <laughs> I've been doing a lot of stuff analyzing why I like certain characters, mm -hmm. um, which is great and fun. I was just going to say another, seems like it might be relevant to this conversation as the law of great three specifically is <laughs> there is definitely a correlation of the, what is called the edge lord character. It's the, ooh, I'm so dark and grim and everything about my life is tortured and haunted and I, you know, mm -hmm but I'm also like super attractive and mysterious. <laughs> I must be nice to look at. <laughs> you know, like of all the X-Men, Wolverine is exceedingly by far the most popular, even though he was introduced far later. And he is the loner yeah. with an amnesiac tortured past who loves a woman who is in a relationship with another man and kind of maybe loves him back, but not in a way that is going to interfere with the fact that she is happy with this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Gruff and blah, blah, blah. We love those characters. Yeah. I personally. Especially how that they would also be attractive. It's like, 
It's not a way to. Well, whether they are or not, they get painted that way. Like Snape, Severus Snape is an example where the books very clearly and explicitly describe the fact that he is not attractive. Yeah. Like that's a major part of his character and backstory and whatever is that he is an unattractive person. Yeah. But if you ever want to like delve into the world of fan fiction and particular erotic fan fiction, Snape is everywhere. They, they make him out to be attractive. Plus, you know, he's played by Alan Rickman, a, an attractive person in the movies. Yeah. Well, okay. What? I'm just wondering about the, oh, I think I said function. That was the word before. The function of having, would, would that be considered the villain is attractive? No, usually, that. well, that does happen a lot too, but okay. the edgelord character is usually a good guy. Oh, okay. So like really, the torture. Yeah, okay. Yeah. You know, like, um, he loves Han Solo more than Luke Skywalker. The scoundrel with a heart of gold. Yeah. I'm trying to hear it. Very dark, thematically and aesthetically. This makes more sense, but it's not the villain. I think I did not. That happens too, though. Yeah. I'm just... Uh, I'm just giggling if I see Cypress comments. It's very difficult to dislike Alan Rickman. This is yeah. very true. Yeah. <laughs> Even when he's a total jerk in love, actually, it's still he's so charming. Yeah. Uh, I'm totally fine with Astarion being a terrible person, but Shadowheart annoys the heck out of me. I honestly think it's because Astarion is always pretending to be okay, and for some reason I like people who pretend to be okay. Sure. Also, Shadowheart's very judgy and controlling. She lives by a set of rules and tries to make everybody else live by those rules and gets upset at them if they don't. Uh oh. And Astarion just does whatever the hell he feels like and doesn't really. Having said, I've not gotten very far in the stories, so maybe there's stuff that happens later. But Astarion's a secret vampire. Shadowheart is a cleric of the god of trickery and deception. Mm. They're fascinating. I mean, Baldur's Gate 3 is mostly awesome because of the amount of choice that the player has. It is ludicrous. Oh. Like, the things that you can do that, as a video gamer, you're used to, like, oh, they, the programmers couldn't have prepared for this possibility. Like, mm. you think you're going out of the... And nope, they've got a... It says what happens there. You know? mm. There's that, and then the characters are all very fleshed out. But yes, all very edgelordy. For sure. I think we should become consultants for video game designers. I love it. Next I mean, career. Creating gonna make lore, it happen. Creating lore for people. Love it. Your friends don't think of Shadowheart as judgmental and controlling, but she's so judgmental and controlling. She's telling what, she, what to do all the time. Okay. All right. I'm done with the exclusive. No, it's entertaining. And you're you're doing enough like explaining. You're trying to everyone dislikes scale for being judgmental. I'm reading these out partly. Yeah, I, I know, I know. Yeah, I'm checking uh and yeah, I would say that that's primarily because Gale is a good character. So when he's being judgmental, it's because he disapproves of your actions ethically. Where Shadowheart is not a good person, just a very in D D terms lawful you know they follow their rules they don't really sort of give so much a crap about whether what you're doing is good or bad so they're lawful so, neutral yeah lawful yeah. neutral i mean alignments are a terrible concept that people mostly don't use anymore thank goodness what is the concept of alignment in original D D, like you would select on two different axes there's good and evil and neutral in between and then there's lawful and chaotic as a separate axis and neutral. I would probably do lawful and evil. Uh, so <laughs> there, are <laughs> there are rules to being evil, Brandon, clearly. <laughs> I mean, in the honestly, part of what's fascinating about DD is that it is its own another like fictional, whatever, you know, uh, the Dresden Files novels is a similar thing where they take real world mythology or stories and kind of magically like mesh it all together in a way that 
treats it all as real. You know, like D and D is almost always in um, polytheistic. You know, there are many different gods of oh, different wow. things, but there's also hell, and it has nine layers, and they match the nine layers of Dante's Inferno. Mm -hmm. so, and hell is monotheism, right? Primarily. Well, hell specifically is yeah, Christianity, Christian. but there are versions of that concept of a place where bad people go after they die in a lot of different including sure. polytheistic religions i feel like it's probably less common but maybe it's I mean, somewhere um, the specific i don't i'm not aware of of any although i'm sure there are plenty that still follow the like if you're good you do you go here and if you're bad you go here mm -hmm. but i'm sure certainly including greek mythology aware of a lot where there are different places to end up based on your actions and, and role in life and it's probably more than two places but some would be considered better than others yeah i mean that's the thing is i don't know if those things necessarily are have the same good bad value yeah um so like the the fields of Elysium versus Hades, you know, mm -hmm. or like Valhalla, you know, where you go if you die in battle. But it's not, I mean, I think it's probably defensible to say that they all represent like values of the culture mm -hmm. that, that I was talking about at the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the same way that people talk about Theseus as being the like paragon of Athenian virtue, mm -hmm. where Hercules is the Spartan version of that you know and i know that doesn't make sense and i'm just saying stuff but yes devils are lawful evil demons are chaotic evil. Just um, robbie says uh, tartarus in greek yeah. mythology oh i feel that is such a great compliment thank you i'm so glad i'd make a great novel i feel so seen by that comment <laughs> Yeah, devils in D and D are, are evil for sure, but they follow the rules. You sign a contract with them, and you like sell your soul to them. And they have a contract. That's so that's funny. Detailed and <laughs> Tartarus in Greek mythology. Yeah, there's another yeah. afterlife. Greek and Egyptian both have an afterlife. Is this we're gonna we're gonna throw out my idea for the ask D and D and me with the oracle and. He said the next time someone's pitching a business idea, I'm going to tell them about it. I don't remember this. Oh, I was so honored. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we shouldn't say well, it. That was a prompt for you to say it if you wanted yeah, to. Yeah, but now I'm like, maybe if it's so good, we shouldn't share it on the internet. Yeah, let's keep it to let's ourselves. We'll definitely. <laughs> I actually have wanted to. That's fine. Okay. okay. Uh, <laughs> no, explorations of the afterlife part interesting the mm -hmm. to me the central premise of that is the philosophy would they refer to as dualism the the mm -hmm. sense that we are at least two different things that there's my body and something else my conscious mind spirit soul whatever which i think is an inherent like if you are a human you know that you're conscious you are observing things right and you also know that your body does a bunch of stuff that you don't observe mm -hmm including but not limited to you know sleeping or whatever you know like mm -hmm. there's times where your body physically exists even though your consciousness is kind of doing something else or not there or whatever so there's an inherent understanding of the fact that there's i can observe things but not everything that my body does mm -hmm. and, and so a very natural exploration is well what would it be to have a body but not the other the conscious or soul mm -hmm. or spirit part which that shows up in stories all over the place mm -hmm. And what would it be to have the conscious, soul, spirit, whatever thing without the body? Mm -hmm. And that second one is the afterlife. You know, that yeah. if the body dies, does this go with it? Mm -hmm. Or does this continue in some kind of a way? It's a natural thing to wonder. So it's, I, I like explorations of the afterlife. Mm -hmm. Honestly, one way we were talking about awareness of the body earlier today, you and I. Yeah. And one way I think is helpful to frame this for people, I know I'm being so like esoteric and whatever today. I hear you judging yourself out loud, which yeah, makes me right. sad. And you've done it about three to four times, so now I'm choosing to point it out. Okay, I appreciate that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm glad that made you laugh, right? <laughs> one way I find helpful to frame this for people to help them understand and think about and respond to themselves differently is the body, the physic our physical presence 
has no ability to be aware of or interact with anything other than the actual present physical environment. The body doesn't know anything about a future, right? Like if it did, we would have no need to feel pain. Yeah. Because pain yeah. is a, an immediately in the moment signal that is mm -hmm. theoretically connected to something which might happen in the future, mm -hmm. but we're just responding to what's happening in the moment, the pain. Well, but also what has happened, like if you break your ankle, Right, but because oh, that's because a if you kept that you walking need to address, on it, yeah, 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 don't. Yeah, that makes sense. If it didn't hurt, you would just keep walking on it, mm -hmm. or might, and that makes the problem worse. Yeah, so it's all that makes future oriented. Sense. And the the consciousness, whatever that's called, in whatever way people think of it, has no ability to be aware of or interact with the present physical, like the actual reality around you. Mm -hmm. Only the past and the future, mostly the future, obviously, is the point. Any thinking about the past is still aimed at the future. And so the two of them working together do a great job of like covering the bases. Your body handles the actual reality of stuff. Mm -hmm. Like if I toss something to you, you can catch it without an intellectual ability to state exactly where it's going or what's going to happen. Yeah. Next. Your body just reads and responds to stuff. Mm -hmm. But it's also very useful to be able to think about and consider the future and override momentary whether it's impulses habits reactions response whatever you want to call it mm -hmm. override or change those things because of some conscious idea that it will be different in the future mm -hmm. which is at the core of a lot of these different like explorations of morality and whatever a lot especially in western and christian and monotheistic stuff there's a lot of that the point is to subjugate the body to the mind to the soul to the spirit the, your body has basic and urge impulses that are terrible and you need to override those things which there's a reason why we would want to like encode and pass that message to people of like mm -hmm. it's important to override impulses and also very serious consequences as well right and we can do that in a lot of different ways and yada yada and whatever and i do think that something that's at least associated with being neurodivergent at this point mm -hmm. is having done that so thoroughly, subjugating the, the body to the mind so mm -hmm. thoroughly, it's like all you do is aim toward a better future and you completely ignore any reality of momentary like impulses. So therefore Nothing neurodivergence is, is a consequence of monotheism. That is the thesis of today's well, stream. <laughs> Uh, I wouldn't say it that way, obviously, but I, I would say that our culture, in a sense, worships intellect, intelligence, oh, yeah. being considered yeah. like the highest virtue in our society, and that is thinking about the future, is making an abstract, like literally to the extent that person A will say something like, hey, I'd rather go to the movies tonight instead of dinner. And person B will translate that into, oh no, they don't want to hang out with me at all, but they don't want to, they don't feel free to tell me that. And so they're making it this other thing and they're suggesting something that they know I don't like to do because I told them two years ago that I don't like to go see a movie. So this is their like passive way of saying they don't like me. So yeah, to the extent totally. like, I'm saying, like people will, instead of observing the actual reality of the thing, will just connect that to an abstract concept or a construct and then deal with it in that way. So we have people who will say things like, hell, people who will say things like, I'm autistic, and then something like the actual thing of what's happening. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm awkward in social situations. Why? Because I'm autistic. And no observation of the actual specific thing that happened that led to someone calling you awkward or you mm -hmm. feeling or them feeling awkward. Yeah. So it just gets talked about as an abstract construct, a concept. Right. Like a wrong. psychic answer. Yeah. I mean, this is the looking for rules. We just we have it. Honestly, I do think of not only what we work with people on, but what I have been doing a lot in my own life and you've been doing a lot of years is you start out as this unthinking, you know, purely impulsive and responsive baby. Mm -hmm. And then you learn things and you control and override things and blah, blah, blah. And you just 
there's theoretically an optimal balance, right? Taking it too far. And yes, I think sometimes some ways of talking about a lot of the things that we and others are struggling with is going too far in the direction of override, you know, like not only trying to override impulses, but responding to an impulse as though it is bad. Like having an impulse to do a thing or enjoying a thing means that doing that thing is something you shouldn't do. It's the direct opposite. Yeah, and that's a really um, dangerous way to have a life that you don't like. Yeah. And the funny thing is that because we are so like, the whole point is how intellectual, you know, how everything needs to have a consciously understood reason or whatever. Mm -hmm. So now a lot of the things that I'm doing and that we're talking about mm -hmm. is just ways of using intellectual and reason and logic and whatever mm -hmm. to help people to rely on those things less. So it's kind of inherently. Mm -hmm. That reminds me of like the, um, the way to like heal of an illness is to give the body more of the illness before that heals. So like the, the concept of like a little bit of poison is medicine. I'm not saying that I literally, have you ever heard about that? Not as that. I, I can think of things that would fall under that category, but I've never heard that. Yeah. No, that reminds, that's like, I think that's one of the concepts of homeopathic medicine because sometimes they'll have you. What's the funny joke that's about funny. <laughs> Austin's oh, okay. has been very funny in the comments. Um, I struggled with conversation pacing for most of my life and felt like I always either took over a conversation or didn't say anything. Can completely relate to that. Me too. Um, then yeah. I had one conversation with my cousin for hours on a drive where we just kept bouncing off each other. We would interrupt each other, but politely, and it had the best flow in a conversation that I'd ever experienced. And that's when I learned that it's everyone else's fault. Obviously, the problem is that people can't keep up with me. <laughs> I love that. I do too. And. 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 Oh, wait, more so. And. <laughs> I mean, obviously, a, a lot of it is joking, including the I learned that it's everyone else's fault. This is some kind of joke, but to some extent, not. And that is something that neurodivergent people in particular will come to of like, feeling better about something because I realize it's not that I'm doing something wrong, it's that the other person is doing something wrong. And of course, the further step of like, neither I nor they are doing anything wrong. And yet still what happens happens. Like mm -hmm. people can dislike things that you do or say without them being wrong or you being wrong mm -hmm. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But things like interruption, for example, why do we have to teach people not to interrupt? Because we all do it naturally because it is actually the most efficient form of communication problem with interruption is that it means that either if I'm actually responding to what you're saying or building off of it or whatever, I, I'm making a prediction about where you're going and jumping in before needing you to actually like go there. So sometimes I get that wrong, but sometimes I get that right. Mm -hmm. Or if it's not about a prediction of where you're going, it is a statement of, I don't know where you might be going with this, but what I'm saying right now is more important to me than wherever you might be going. Mm -hmm. Which isn't inherently a bad thing, but does sometimes make people feel like, oh, so you don't care what I'm saying next. Mm -hmm. But it is more efficient, literally, like, you know, less time and less energy to say, I'm going to respond to the thing that I just had a response to instead of holding that in my mind and letting you say a bunch of other stuff that I'm not listening to because I'm holding in mind what I wanted mm -hmm. to say anyway. Mm -hmm. And just like anything else, should you interrupt people? No. Should you avoid interrupting people? No. It's not that there's not a rule or a should or shouldn't. Just Sometimes it works great, sometimes it doesn't. I think that's I think that's kind of important. Not just about interruption, but just generally it's like there isn't there's nothing like fault is an abstract concept, not an actual even interruption, even though we're describing a thing which happened, an observable experience, mm -hmm. the concept of interruption mm -hmm. is itself an abstract concept. Because mm -hmm. you and I could observe the same thing, and I could say that was an interruption. You could say it was not an interruption. Mm -hmm. and we could debate that. I got told off. There's another comment. I got told off a lot as a kid for interrupting, so I got very conscious of it. But with this conversation, we both just had a lot to say. And if we wanted to get anything in edgewise, you have to interrupt. But each time we would acknowledge what the other was saying and make sure to get back to their point. 
It was beautiful and glorious. I love those conversations. That is beautiful and glorious. Although I'll say, you don't always have to get back to the other person's point. Again, it depends on the context, what you're doing, what you're discussing, who you're with. When we're brainstorming, we don't always have to get back to a point mm -hmm. someone made. Like if what yeah. you're doing just prompts an idea in me and then we go off on a different direction, cool. Mm -hmm. But yeah, a lot of it does have to do with another abstract concept of respect, respect and disrespect. And that yeah. it's disrespectful to interrupt me. Same as it's disrespectful to not remember what I said, for example, right? That like, then I would be the most disrespectful person on earth. Well, <laughs> that's the thing that people with ADHD, especially yeah. learn is, oh no, if I didn't focus on what that person's saying, it means I'm disrespecting them. Mm -hmm. And so you put a lot of effort into hiding the fact that you tuned out or mm -hmm. paid attention to something else or missed yeah. it. And and I guess that's only my self perception because I have people tell me pretty often I have like a great memory and they're so confused. Um. So Boston Cider says, and I think this is a good point. I think it helps to at least acknowledge that you lost their point and show that what they're saying is important to you. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I've had people be relieved when I do that. They're like, oh my gosh, someone's listening to me enough that they're admitting that they got lost. Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, that's what we were just talking about, the like losing track. I think they're, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they're referring to how they said that they would acknowledge and get back to the other person's point. I was saying, oh, oh, yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it can, it can help certainly, especially with the feeling disrespected or frankly, our group of people, you know, like the kinds of people that are mostly talking on this stream and using language that we use and whatever use unheard the same way most people use disrespected. I'm feeling unheard and I'm feeling disrespected more or less is used in the same situations and means the same thing. Yeah. Um, just different connotations and whatever. But yeah, if, if someone is feeling unheard, acknowledging their point and whatever um, will help them to feel less unheard, feel more heard. Mm -hmm. But I, I do get into this sometimes with people where because you know that i do a specific thing of incentivizing people to pay attention to and state back like not just saying i understand but saying here's what i understand you to be saying because if i just say and you either have to think that i do understand and we move on or you have to say are you sure you understand and check with me mm -hmm. whatever and that's kind of a high bar mm -hmm. but it often does lead to i think i understand but we're really understanding two different yeah. So I do get people specific like that. And then sometimes people will say, well, I don't want to always just repeat back to the other person exactly what they said, which of course not. Like that is not efficient communication. That's, mm -hmm. you know, it's like riding a bike with training wheels. It's what mm -hmm. you do to like shift into that when you need to be specific and deliberate. Mm -hmm. But there are many ways to respond to a person that indicate that you heard them mm -hmm. without saying back to them what they said. If you say to me, can you pass the salt and I hand you the salt, I'm behaving in a way that I would not have behaved had I not heard you. Yeah. So I don't need to verbally, and I know that's a, a very, um, I don't know, over the top example of this particular thing. But yeah, like if somebody is saying, if someone's like, it just feels like you don't care about me, I don't have to say back like, you're saying it feels like I don't care about you before I respond. If I respond by saying I do care about you, obviously that's a response to what you just said. Mm -hmm. And this is how conversation normally happens. It's just when we know that we're missing things or misinterpreting things, and especially when we know it's happening in a pattern and an impactful way, mm -hmm. then yeah, it's good to back up and be very slow and cautious and deliberate. Yeah. But there are, if you say it feels like I don't love you or I don't care about you, and then I say, what do you think about the bears? Then yes, I can understand why you would think that I don't care about you and I didn't hear or understand your point. Even if in my head, I'm about to use the bears as a metaphor to explain to you why I do care about, you know, like even if it is actually a response, you might not see it that way. Um, Boston Cider says, when I've worked at a front counter or dealt with people at a front counter, it's made all the difference 
to clarify what the other person is saying to make sure you understand. I've had people jump really quickly to conclusions about what I need because they're trying to finish the interaction as quickly as possible. Mm. Yeah. yeah. There's another comment in there. It says, why does the guy? Not let the two women talk. Are you sexist? Um, I would say no. <laughs> And we are talking. Maybe we just all have different rhythms. I mean, certainly we have different rhythms and ways of working and discussing things. But to be honest, not by the way I think that most likely this person means it or that people generally mean it. But yeah, I'm sexist in the same way that I'm racist and other things. That I I think it's important that we all understand and acknowledge about ourselves that we do have perceptions that are influenced by our culture, our experiences, our etc. I, I don't think that um, women are less valuable than men, certainly. But I, if I were to say that I don't, that nothing about the way I interact with people is influenced by my perception of their gender, I don't think that's true. That would be a way of saying that gender is not important. And I, yeah. I think it's a construct, but I don't think it's important that people have the way of presenting themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I don't know. Yeah. It definitely might be influenced by that. That's certainly not my conscious intention, but I am open to the feedback because I know I do have things. I like think that. another, I don't, I don't know exactly how to put this of Maria Brandon jump in, but I think another dynamic of this stream that technically that that doesn't relate to gender is that both Marie and I became attracted to working at this business because of you regardless of your gender and so I think there's sort of a like oh my like mentor slash supervisor slash friend whatever role you're playing has something interesting to say so I really hear about listening to it and I'm learning something new. And so I, I don't know. I feel like, I feel like that's mostly the reason why you talk more. I mean, certainly I agree with what you're saying and there's a lot of other contextual factors as well. You know, that, that I used to do this stream by myself and mm -hmm. literally got used to sitting on here and talking for an hour by myself with no one else. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, that's another comment. And yes, I. You don't have to read everyone. I, I trust you. Well, they're asking about what conditioner and shampoo that I use. <laughs> um, no, I do. I think. I really think we should do corporate sponsorships. <laughs> Twenty dollars off of Brandon saying, "Oh, I'm actually using Tresemme." <laughs> I'll answer honestly <laughs> in that I use, I don't even, I know the brand is O and M and the way that I found it was because a couple years ago, people kept saying that I looked like Jason Momoa and I, I was growing my hair out again. I had it long when I was younger, but I didn't take care of it. Mm -hmm. And after the pandemic began, I started growing it out again and was trying to like learn how to take care of it. And so I literally Googled, like looked up what is Jason Momoa's like <laughs> hairstylist do and say. Yeah. And it was a product that the hairstylist recommended. So I, I got it. Wow. Uh, Sometimes things are really that easy. Well, I think that's a very. Uh, <laughs> or low cost. Very it's a great, it's a great <laughs> comment from Fast Insider. Patrick Rothfuss gets constant questions about his beard, and his response is usually a beard is the only thing you achieve by being lazy. <laughs> Oh, that Aww. just makes me feel really bad for Patrick Rothfuss. I, wish I, I feel like, Rothfuss. from what I've known from other people with facial hair, I think sometimes having a beard can be harder than shaving, right? It takes a lot of maintenance. Yeah, right? but I don't know. At Target, I'll see like a beard oil. I'm like, beard you know, oil. A lot of effort into <laughs> either. I've never put a lot of effort into any version of thing I've tried. So. Yeah, I think it depends on the person. You've no Brandon Tesno's just said can you clarify that Sorry, you're talking about hair? hair and, <laughs> yeah, hair and beard. Yeah. <laughs> like, um, that does not apply to other parts of your life. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> no. um 
that that reminds me of an earlier comment I didn't I didn't um, read out from Boston Cider. We need a Brandon judging himself coin jar like a swear jar. So Caitlin, maybe you can take care of that. Oh, I love that. <laughs> I love that so much. Yeah. Well, I mean. Well, that's why I pointed it out, and I said like three or four times. I I I met the threshold to mention it because I didn't like it the first three times, but. And that I is my, it. I am, I am the jar. I'm listening. I appreciate it then. <laughs> and I still do. Yeah. But that's, that would be really funny. Or just like different versions of that. Like Caitlin makes a dad joke and we drop a marble. <laughs> well, honestly, I mean, today specifically, a lot of those self-judgmental comments were things that we're talking about. Like I notice I am talking a lot about things that the two of you are not interested in. You know, I'm talking to a I commenter so... about, or at least don't, don't have as much of a I don't have as much jump in on. yeah I don't have as much of an ability to jump in on but I am very interested in these things. yeah same. and I am always concerned about talking too much it's a great fear of mine I what would you mean by talking too much talking more than other people want me to well then you just have to trust that other people will tell you I do I um do. I I interrupt people regularly so if a, I get to the point where I think you're talking too much. I'm probably going to interrupt because I'm going to want to say something. So I don't think you should feel feel bad or worry about it. <laughs> well, I don't worry about it with you. Um, I do trust you to interrupt or tell me. Or yeah. I am also aware that different people are going to view it and have different thoughts and opinions about it. And mm -hmm. that some people will still think that I'm domineering or mansplaining or various different things and yeah i hate the idea that i'm going to give that impression i know that i am and the only way not to ever give that impression is to just not talk so i do i do the streams anyway and i talk anyway but that's why i think it's important to like be aware of the fact that i know i i have all kinds of flaws and limitations so i don't get angry in response oh, it's too to away so I don't get angry in response to a suggestion. A suggestion or a question. You know, that if somebody's suggesting that something I'm doing may be sexist either in origin or in the way in which it's perceived, I want to be open to that and explore that. Yeah, but I think sometimes because people are commenting, it's hard to tell if something's sarcasm or just like playful well, true. versus like, this is my deep dive social analysis of the current thing I'm doing. Absolutely. And you know, the three of us talked about this a couple of weeks ago off stream because I am aware enough of various contextual things to be able to make an assessment of whether I think someone is just trolling and whatever, which I think is quite likely in this case, especially since the follow-up question was about my shampoo and conditioner and, you know, talking about not trusting people with man buns uh not to mention the name of the commenter but i do kind of have an, a personal guideline for myself to respond sincerely to anything and everything because even if somebody is trolling i don't know just to clarify your not. definition of trolling is that someone is saying like it's kind of messing should... with you yeah okay because yeah. some but some people think of at least i think of the word troll as like really really bad oh like but you just mean it more as like I just am clarifying that people are yeah like, trying to get a reaction out of you yeah. trying to mess with you kind of thing. Um, in this particular case, it seems to me like the person is probably trying to be funny with what they're doing. And yeah, there is humor to it. Yeah, but I do try to respond to these things authentically and sincerely because sometimes people actually want to know and they just feel silly about caring about it. Well, and also and so put it in that format. I think part of the origin of humor is observable conclusions that some people would draw in sort of a like angry or neutral way and other people can highlight it as humor so i don't know yeah i mean yes i love thinking time about humor i know we gotta uh wrap up but i do think also if something somebody asks or does does bring up discomfort in me right that to respond to that with genuine sincerity and curiosity about curiosity, yeah. This, this is making me uncomfortable. It's making me uncomfortable. Well, sure. 
And I want to be authentic about that and explore yeah. that rather than get defensive or dismissive or write yeah. it off. Or, yeah. you know. And I feel like that's important too, especially in like online streaming stuff that it's not, we're not BSing, but we're also being like humble and, you know. Yeah. I mean, certainly there are some comments that, you know, that you wouldn't, I wouldn't yeah. respond to literally anything and everything. Yeah. But these are. Wait, that's not engagement. your rule? I'm the devil because I'm rule? Oh, no, what was it? Lawful evil. Lawful and evil. There we go. Uh, and on that beautiful note. Yes, we do. Happy Halloween happy and Halloween. love happy of life and Birds Day. Thank you for being with us in the chat. Boston Cider says, I need an emoji for when Brandon says, assume people are sincere until you are given more information. And I feel like you're really like this or something. I'm sincere, like, give me a hug. <laughs> yeah. I love the emoji. But it's always more assume. assume they are. Yeah, assume, yeah. <laughs> well, this was right, lovely. Thank you and uh, there's some really cool emojis coming up in the chat. Oh, little hearts. Um, yeah, it's been it's been good to talk with you both. We'll be interested in writing a the summary like, for this. We've gone all over the place. Yeah, I would say lore stories. Lore. I feel like it was very lore loreish. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Good to be with you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Same time. I think you're the one who turns it off, Brandon. I literally just remembered that. Yeah. Yeah. Goodbye, people. Bye. Human.